Welcome to another episode of the Own Your Career podcast, formerly known as the Steer Your Career with Kadima, the Sick Career podcast. I talk about that in this episode where we share some acronyms with my guest, Jennifer Dulski. Jennifer has an extremely impressive career. She went to Cornell undergrad, went to Cornell for her MBA, and she then worked at Yahoo for a number of years. She started a business, sold it to Google. She worked at Facebook during the same time that I was there. And surprisingly, we did not know each other. Then she wound up working on multiple boards, including Weight Watchers next to Oprah Winfrey. She wrote a book, Purposeful, about really developing purposeful business. And now she started her own company called Rising Team, which is helping to lift teams and managers to develop better people, to create better psychological safety, and just make work better. You're going to learn a lot from Jennifer about her career, about how she got some board opportunities and recommendations that she will have for you if you want to get board experience and board opportunities, which is a great opportunity to grow your career. She'll talk a lot about what good leadership is, good teamwork is, and how she took a deliberate step back to take two steps forward. So I think you'll enjoy this conversation with Jennifer and myself. And before we cut into that episode, just as a reminder, at Kadima Careers, we're on a mission to accelerate a million careers by 2040. And if you have a career that wants to be accelerated, we can help. We help in three different ways. One, we have a do-it-yourself course. You can follow our framework, our process that will just get you more interviews, offers, and money. Do it all on your own. If you're someone who likes more of a community and a group opportunity, we have group coaching where you get access to me and to work with our community of amazing coaches and clients. And if you want personalized coaching, essentially unlimited access to me and our Kadima coaches, we have personalized coaching as well. All of these will help you get a better job quickly, confidently, and with lots more money. And with that, I'm going to hand you off to Jennifer before I leave you with three final words. Own your career. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Own Your Career podcast. Today, I am very excited to have a former Googler uh, from where I work, even though we didn't know each other back then, uh, someone who is creating a new business that is helping to uplift teams and employee engagement and really trying to transform the workplace, Jennifer Dulski. Jennifer and I met on LinkedIn, but through an indirect route. I think someone on your sales team was very effective about reaching out to me because I am a CEO now at a company. And I think you were reaching out to me and saying, hey, are you managing your team effectively? Are your employees engaged at Kadima Careers? And we can help at Rising Team. So I started to probe around a little bit with Rising Team. And then I saw who the founder was. I was like, holy shit, this woman, Jennifer Dulski is a pretty impressive woman. Reached out and uh, Jennifer was kind enough to reply to my response on LinkedIn. So with that, Jennifer, Welcome to the Own Your Career podcast and tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate you having me. So my story, I'll do the short version. I essentially have been looking for ways my whole life to create positive impact in the world at varying levels of depth and breadth. And I started my career as a teacher. I taught high school for four years and I started a nonprofit to help kids become first gen college graduates. And I loved that job. And actually it's one of the things in my life I'm most proud of because even though I only ran it for four years, I passed it off to someone else who did the same and it's about to hit its 30th anniversary. So lots of ways to create scale in the world, one of which is time. And then I essentially have had a 25 year career in tech after that, because in my search to create impact, I realized that one key way to do that was through technology and through the internet in particular. And so I spent 10 years at Yahoo and have done a few startups. I helped run change.org for five years. I spent a few years each at Google, as you mentioned, and also at Facebook. And now I have started and am leading Rising Team. 
Awesome. And tell the listeners a little bit about Rising Team, because I think it's a really amazing concept. And that's what got me on a call with your sales team. Yeah. And um, yeah, this is the company I feel like I have been meant to build my whole life. It's the thing I wish I had had as a leader of teams during my whole career. And what we build is software to create engaging interactive team development experiences that any manager can run without needing an outside facilitator. So if you think about it, you know, when I was a manager and when I was managing other managers, I was very lucky to have coaches and get sent to trainings. And I always felt like I was being taught to fish and then having to go back to the lake that was my team with a book on how to fish and instead of a fishing pole. And so what we do is create we call them kits that people can run on different topics, leadership or connection topics that then make their team feel understood and valued and connected and more engaged and want to work there longer and work better together. Awesome. And, and you've worked at some pretty impressive historic companies. You were at Yahoo during their glory days. Uh, you, were, you were acquired by Google, so you were part of Google. Companies that really have a strong culture, a strong focus on people leadership. How, how much have your has your experience at those companies or maybe at um, uh, other organizations that you've been part of, like change.org, inspired what you're building here? And were they patterns that you saw that were working well that you tried to take here into rising teams? Also, were there anti-patterns that you saw that were bringing down teams and demotivating teams that you wanted to eradicate, but like talk a little bit about what motivated you to start this initiative. Really, I'd say some of each, right? So certainly in the earliest days of the internet, there was some pretty amazing culture at some of those places. So, you know, Yahoo was an incredible place to work in the early days. And I have deep, strong connections and friendships from those days that came out of the culture of that company. And at the same time, there was a lot that was hard to replicate, right? Because the challenges as companies grow, you cannot build culture and connection top down. You have to do it team by team. That means every manager has to individually work on it. And that was the the really hard thing. And that was what didn't happen. So as companies scaled, you have really uneven nature of some teams are, you know, really high performing and doing super well. And other teams are feel unvalued and are leaving. And as they say, 50% of people quit a company because of their manager, not because of the company culture overall. And so the reason I created this is to make it easy for every manager at every level, even those who aren't naturally disposed to it or don't, you know, create tools themselves like I had done to be able to do this on their own. You've created this amazing tool and I can't wait to roll it out with Kadima Careers. As I told you, we're going to do it in the first quarter. We're just in a crunch (laughs) for the fourth quarter. He's committing publicly, which helps with accountability. It will be on our first quarter OKRs, which is actually a great management uh, tool that we learned at Google. While I was at Google, and like I've also worked at American Express and Facebook, companies that did put a lot of emphasis on teams and management. While I was at Google, they did a lot of research on psychological safety and the importance of that. They did work with Amy Edmondson on that. There are a lot of tools and resources that are out there with the companies. There are some measurements that occur as well. Like, I don't know if you recall during your time at Google, the manager feedback survey or the Google yeah, Guys Google survey. Based, yeah. So there's lots of metrics and measurements there, but I found that there was very little teeth behind it and very little accountability behind it. And at Google, actually, we were not allowed as managers to put down our manager feedback score or upward feedback score for our performance review as a manager. So we weren't getting rewarded or punished because of that. Now you're giving people amazing tools, amazing resources to leverage this. What's a disconnect between bringing people to the water, then having them drink from it and actually implement these amazing tools and processes? This is the fishing book versus fishing pole problem that I'm talking about, because typically what happens is we teach people new skills. Like let's say Google does this research on psychological safety. You're right. They have data that shows it is the number one driver of high performing teams. They then teach that to managers in one of two ways, either self learned in some kind of learning management system where you watch a video or you read something and you, you know, take a quiz and you check the box that you've done it, or they do it in some kind of facilitated way 
with a, either a live in-person facilitator or a virtual facilitator. The first category is kind of dry and boring and doesn't give you, again, anything to take back to your team. The second is more engaging and people tend to love facilitated things, but the problem with that is it's expensive and it's really hard to scale at all levels and it doesn't ensure any follow-up behavior. So this is why the software tools are so important, whether it's rising team or something else. The idea is that you give people the ability to just follow the steps, do the things a facilitator would do, like here's what we're going to learn. Here's an icebreaker. Here are some ground rules. Here's an activity but in a way that you actively bring it to life with your whole team rather than just learning it by yourself and coming back and then trying to figure out how to bring it back to life on your own. I'd be curious about what has informed your perspective on developing this. Again, like you've worked for some ridiculously amazing companies. I forgot to mention Facebook. You were at Facebook as well. And, and we actually overlapped there almost exact same time. Yes. I think you were there September 2017 to May 2019, I was there from uh, October 2017 until January 2019. So we overlapped mm -hmm. there. It was very interesting times at uh, Facebook at the time. Cheryl was there, um, lo lots of stuff going on. You're, you're also on boards, and I want to talk to you about board leadership opportunities for people yeah. and especially women that are trying yeah. to get ahead. What have you taken away from like to inform rising teams? Like, are, are there some notable things that you learned? Like you mentioned psychological safety at Google. Are there some things, p bits and pieces that you took from your board experience, from the companies that you've worked with that has helped inform? Absolutely. And also from all the things I've read and all the mentors I've had. And, you know, I, the other thing I do now is I teach two classes at the business school at Stanford and it's all case based. So I have leaders coming into the class every single week and we're learning about their challenges and accomplishments and so forth. And so I pull all of that together. The core of Rising Team is the leadership best practices and science plus the experience. And, you know, if you think about it in the class that I teach, there are some things that come straight out of the science, like hiring best practices and how to set up a board in the first place and so forth. And then there are other things that just come from pure experience. So as an example, two of the lessons that I teach in class that have come from my own work experience and others, and now are kits inside Rising Team. One is motivators and the other is resilience. So motivators is the notion that everybody is motivated by different things. We can say, often the mistake people make as leaders is to assume that people are motivated by the same thing they are. Mm -hmm. And I learned this lesson kind of the hard way in Early in my career, when I had someone on my team come up to me and say, you know, if I ever do a good job, just pay me more money. Like, I don't really care about recognition. I just like a spot bonus or something like that. And at first I was really taken aback by that. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized if she didn't tell me, I wouldn't know. And then I would be doing all the wrong things to motivate her. And so I, at that time, this is now almost 20 years ago, I said, okay, I'm just going to give you an empty circle. Imagine it's a pie chart. Now tell me all the factors that you care about. Is it compensation? Is it flexibility? Is it scope? Is it, you know, title? And then weight them as to how important they are on the pie chart and then color code it red, yellow, and green to tell me how happy you are with each of those things. And I had everybody do it on my team. I learned two key lessons. One is people are very unique. So there's definitely different things on people's pie charts. And the other thing is there are some commonalities underneath that are very, very common. Like compensation is really important to people until they feel like they're paid what they're worth. Mm -hmm. And then compensation kind of disappears and other things like autonomy and responsibility and so forth become bigger. So that was kind of one key learning. And the second is about resilience, which is, I call it everybody's got something. This is from the title of Robin Roberts' book, which I absolutely love if you haven't read it. Is, is um, she from ESPN, that Robin Roberts? Yes, from GMA, Good Morning America. Yeah. And yeah, um, what, what, she what's is, the book called? Everybody's Got Something. It's just a wonderful book about her own personal resilience and very inspiring for others. And 
you know, the, the core premises, we've all, we're all dealing with things. And so as a leader or as an individual, we have to remember that on any given day, even though you may be trying to think about work from whatever time to whatever time, we often can't because there's other things going on in our lives. And that's true if we're a leader of everyone on our team. So on any given day, someone might be getting tough medical news and someone else might be going through a divorce and someone else might have a kid who needs them to be picked up at school. And there's just stuff going on in all our lives and it impacts how we lead. It also impacts our own growth in our own careers and the best teams, the most happy and productive teams are the ones that feel comfortable to share that stuff with each other. And so that's a core part of rising team too, is how do we get that level of trust so that we can say, Hey, like I, I had something a couple of months ago where our dog that we had had for 17 years passed away. Mm. And I, I've never even had a pet before. And so this was new to me. And, you know, I was thinking like, do I say anything to my team? Do I not? I decided to, we have a resilience support channel in Slack. And, you know, I posted it and I posted some pictures and it was amazing how supportive the team was and creating the kind of place where people do feel comfortable to post those things is really important. As companies choose to work with you, so you're giving them this amazing tool to get insight into their teams, to understand the motivating factors, to help build psychological safety, to build all these factors that make more effective teams, more effective results, retain employees. There's a lot of economic benefits. There's a lot of selection bias, though, of who is going to choose to use this tool and this software that you've developed. What do you think are the differences of leaders that say, hey, Jennifer, help me and my team raise the level here and support yeah. versus those that won't even return your sales call? Like where that you don't even, like you figure like we won't even bother to call because they won't give a shit. That is definitely true. You have to care about something in the first place to want to buy it. And also we're in some ways creating a new category. And so sometimes people don't even know they're looking for this thing. There's a famous book written now many decades ago called Crossing the Chasm. I don't know if you've ever heard about this book. We used to study it in business school like in the 90s. But the idea is that when new things, disruptive products come out, the first thing that happens is you get these early adopters who are really passionate, totally get it, you know, are, are excited to jump in and use something. And then over time, as enough of them do it and word of mouth spreads and so forth, it crosses the chasm and makes a big jump over to, you know, traditional everyday people who haven't seen the vision ahead of time, but now everybody else is doing it. And so for a product like ours, we definitely have a certain set of early adopters who are, as you said, passionate about their teams, want their organizations to be really successful and connected. We have also a number of people who have a serious pain point, right? Like if you think about the workplace today, it's so massively challenged versus what it was even five years ago. We've got, mm -hmm. you know, hybrid work that causes people to be really disconnected. We have these return to office mandates that are causing tons of frustration. You have like Gen Z employees who have really high expectations about belonging and inclusion and so forth. You have the economy is difficult. Then on top of that, you add AI and everybody feels pressured to learn AI and is it going to replace my job? It's just so overwhelming. And so some people come to us with a pain point and that is another reason to get involved. But in general, you're right. The teams that already have a, a passion and an interest for, for doing it, do it first. And they also see the best results. You see huge movements in things like employee NPS and intent to stay at the company and so forth. So a, a lot of the clients that we work with, we, we work with them to identify a list of at least 40 target companies that are aligned with their values. And sometimes it's compensation, sometimes it's work-life balance, sometimes it's a supportive culture. Um, a, lo a lot of the times it's supportive culture. They're trying to leave a bad management situation or something like that. So the tools that like I advise people to look at is Glassdoor, which is a fairly, fairly calibrated system based on employee feedback on how the, uh, the culture is at the company. It's not perfect, but it's pretty mm -hmm. decent. As you're thinking about like the clients that you work with, and if you look at the companies that are eager to work with rising team, and my hunch is those are the sort of companies that are probably care about their employees or better places to work. What, what's like without giving away your sales strategy, 
What, what do you look for in companies that we can share with our listeners of how do they pick a good company to work for? Yeah, it's so interesting. Well, it's it's different, I think, from what, what we would pick versus what you'd want to pick as right. a as an right. You might do employee. like size or budget or things like right, that. Right, exactly. I, I love the idea of using Glassdoor. I think that's a great idea. I also think, you know, combing LinkedIn for your network and friends and friends who work there and trying to talk to people about what it's actually like is a really good idea. Um, for us, we might actually do the opposite. Like when we first started targeting companies, we said we want them of a certain size. We want hybrid workforces because that's the most challenging thing to deal with. And we actually looked at low glass door scores. Interesting. For like you a really turnaround. need it when your yeah. you know culture is struggling. As it turns out, you know it's really been a mix. I'd say of of people on the leading edge and people with the pain point, as as we talked about. Yeah. Is there any other way that you would advise someone on the outside who's looking to get on the inside of companies besides like anecdotal through your friends and family and LinkedIn connections and Glassdoor to try to predict, are you going to a company that gives a crap about you, that cares about psychological safety, that cares about work-life balance, that would do a pie chart like you're talking about yeah. to like understand individual motivations? Like if you advise people, how do people determine what companies to, to target? Yeah, I mean, I think the two things we talked about already are where I would start. But the other thing I might consider is just looking at the media about the company, right? Because there's a lot that's written, especially about large companies. There's a lot that's written and including about executives and what they say and whether there have been layoffs and what they're doing, you know, to promote culture and benefits and so forth. If you do a deep dive into media that's covered these companies, you can learn a lot about them. And then the other thing you might consider is like starting with looking for the best instead of just looking at companies and then saying, okay, are they good enough? Start with the lists of best companies to work for. And, you know, there's tons and tons of these awards and lists. And if you start there, all of those are done by surveys of employees. And so it's another good way to see if um, to sort of target the companies that make the best lists would be a good place to start. So I'm guessing Elon Musk and his portfolio of companies would be a, potentially a good customer for you because they're they're starting from a very low spot, although I don't know if he has enough self-awareness and interest in the employee uh, yeah. behavior. And you don't need to reveal your customers. But my, if I was a betting person, I would guess that X is not a customer of yours. You can see on our website. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet, but let's talk a little bit about the book that you wrote, Purposeful. Talk a little bit about why you wrote that, what the book's about, what are you trying to convey? You're obviously a very learned woman. You've quoted already a couple of great books here. So you're not doing this for shits and giggles. There's probably a reason that you did this. It's interesting. Writing a book is something I had always wanted to do. Just I love writing and I love reading and it felt like there were important things to put out in the world. That said, I always tell people about writing a book that way more people will read what you write online than will ever read your book, unless you're Michelle Obama or something like that. Like my book is a bestseller and I still have single individual posts that I've written online that have been read by more people than my book. Right. Um, so that said, the reason I wrote this book is because you know I had spent probably 15 years working in tech and then I went to work at change.org. And I had this big aha moment that the same skills that I had seen in entrepreneurs starting companies were the skills that I saw these incredible movement starters using to start these world changing campaigns. And the incredible thing about it is that those people were not Tony Robbins or Gloria Steinem. They were just regular people. They were teenagers and grandparents and neighborhood moms and so forth. And yet they were able to start these, these amazing movements that really made a big difference all around the world. And I thought, gosh, if we could just help more people understand what it takes to do that and the fact that anyone can do it, that perhaps that would be a way to create more impact in the world. Again, I've always felt like my own impact is minuscule in comparison to empowering the people around me and their potential impact. So that's why I wrote the book and the book summarizes those key factors that it takes to be successful. And as you think about making impact and you think about your career, you've worked for companies, you've started companies, you've sold companies, you've, you've started new companies as well. How have you thought about those decisions of going to work for a big company at the time, Yahoo, Facebook versus 
starting your company that sold to Google, starting Rising Team, like what, what went into the decision-making process, the risk reward at the time, maybe lifestyle yeah. decisions at the time, because they're very different routes, very different risk reward dynamics. For me, I go back to the motivators chart. I wasn't necessarily making the chart for myself in those early days, but if I had, it would have been those factors in the chart that were driving my decisions. So as an example, I have, well, you're right. There have been certain times in my life where I have chosen based on more financially based decisions of, you know, what I needed to do to support my family and so forth. I have often also made decisions that were less financially rewarding because I thought they would be more rewarding from an impact perspective or from a learning perspective. So for me, the top factors in my pie chart were always impact and learning. I just love learning new things. And so as an example, when I left business school and I took the job at Yahoo, I was so excited because it was the dawning of the internet. And I thought this thing was going to be so big and so explosive. And I knew I would learn so much that job paid less than half as much as the other offers I had coming out of business school. Now, I was very lucky. I will say I was, you know, a lot of privilege here, but I had a full tuition fellowship to business school. So I did not have debt coming out of business school, and that allowed me to take a job that paid half as much as something else. If I had had a lot of debt, I might not have been able to make that decision, but it was, I'll learn a lot and I might be able to make a difference. And then I spent actually 10 years, almost 10 years at Yahoo, which in today's standards is a long time to stay at a single company. And I stayed because I kept learning the whole time. So I started on the marketing side. Then I had a kind of career epiphany, which we can talk about if you want. And I moved into a general management role. And then I ended up managing a whole suite of businesses. And so that whole time I was just continuously learning, getting bigger and bigger teams, more scope. And then at the time when I felt like I wasn't really learning as much anymore, I said, it's time to go and do something new. And that's when I did my first company startup. I had done that nonprofit startup before. but I want to get back to that career epiphany. First, I want to just share with you like my thought process yeah. of going like because I've worked for lots of large companies. This is my first startup I've worked for. I've worked in venture capital. So I've seen how unlikely it is that a startup actually succeeds. The numbers that just don't play out for that. But a lot of the decision making had to do with my family. And when we had young kids, it made a lot more sense for me to work at a company where I didn't have to work as hard. American Express, I was able to work from like nine to six. And I didn't even get, at that time it was Blackberries, but I didn't even get a Blackberry until I got to a certain level and they didn't have laptops. So when I left the work, I left work. I think maybe one time I got a phone call over something from my boss in the five and a half years there. And then when I went to, uh, as my kids got older, now my kids are 17, my boys are 17, my daughter's 15. They don't really want to spend that much time with me. Um, <laughs> I like to spend time with them, but I, I don't know, like they're just playing video games anyway. They don't want to hang out with me. So now I have more time to dedicate to my company. And also I was able to save up some money during those times it, at Google and Facebook and Salesforce so that I can invest a little bit now. So mine like was based on that. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I have uh, two other things to mention here. One is I've done the back and forth because I see the benefit of each one. And so when you're at a big company, you have so many more resources, you can do much more and things are slower because there's just more politics, more bureaucracy. And so for a while, I get really excited about all the resourcing and then I get kind of tired of the bureaucracy and then I go back to a startup and you have to be super scrappy. You don't have any resources, but you have a lot of control and a lot of decision-making power to create the culture you want and all of that. And when I think about my family, I did a little bit of what you're talking about, which is create some stability when the kids were younger. I also have found startups to be surprisingly flexible in a way that allows for the balance. I, to me, I never call it balance. I call it work-life mashup because they're kind of just intertwined. But for instance, when my kids were younger and I was doing my first startup, I put the office across the street from the place where they took dance every day. And so they would come over and I would do their bun and send them off to dance. And then they'd come by and do their homework after school. And I could never have done that at a big yeah. company. So there's a lot of like 
choice around being an entrepreneur or working at a startup that um, is also can be good for young families. And you hinted before, I want to get back to it, your career epiphany. So talk, talk about the career epiphany you had. So when I first started working at Yahoo, I had come right out of business school and I took a job in marketing, which in business school, marketing is taught more as like general management than it is in tech. It's often more just purely acquiring customers and, and customer lifecycle stuff. And I loved the marketing group at Yahoo and I did well and kind of grew up in that organization. And then one day I was at a sales conference where we had a speaker from Gallup, the organization that also does StrengthsFinder. And he put up a two by two chart on a slide, which said on the X axis are talents. These are things that come really easily and naturally to you that you probably have been good at since you were a kid that give you energy. You know, if I ask your parents or childhood friends, like, what were you like as a child? That's what they would describe. And then on the Y axis were skills. These are things you learn to be good at over time, but don't necessarily, they, they can be in areas of talent or they can be in areas of low talent. And so you end up with a two by two chart. So one's like natural and one is like learned almost. Learned, exactly. Yeah. And you can learn to be better at the things you're naturally good at, right? And he said, these are the happiest and most successful people. They're in the upper right quadrant. They learn to be amazing at things they're naturally also love to do and naturally good at. And he said, if you're in the upper left, you're probably in the wrong job. If you're in the lower right, because you can learn, you can grow in that area of natural talent. And if you're in the lower left, you're kind of probably wrong industry or just everything's wrong. And he then asked a question, which is how many of you are in the job you've always known you wanted to have? <laughs> And I was in a room full of salespeople and it was like 90% of the hands shot up. Like these people have been selling lemonade, you know, and t-shirts and whatever since they were small. And then the CMO of our company was sitting right in front of me. She was my boss. I was essentially next in line for her job and her hand shot straight up. And I had this moment to myself where I just thought, oh my God, I'm in the wrong job. Like, I don't even want her job. I am, I might be next in line for it, but this is not the thing I love and that I've been doing since I was a child. And so I realized that I wanted to do something different. I wanted to build products. I wanted to run businesses. So at that point I applied for what was the only GM job open in Yahoo at the time, which was running Yahoo Autos. Hmm. I knew nothing about cars, but I wanted to like create a, a business. This is the entrepreneur in me. And I applied for the job and miraculously, a guy named James Slavitt, who I will always be grateful for, he offered me the job, even though arguably I wasn't completely qualified. I was qualified in, in many ways, and especially in terms of understanding the way Yahoo worked and so forth. But the job was two levels below the job I already had. And so they wanted me to take a two level demotion to take this job. And I did not want to do that. And so I tried to negotiate with them to say, you should really cross train your leaders. You know, I was an SVP. They wanted me to move to director. I was like, really, we shouldn't do this. And they said, it'll set a bad precedent if we change the level of the job. And this is big company stuff by then. Um, and so we agreed to compromise and I took a one level demotion and they up leveled the job by one. I thought it was fair. And, but a lot of people internally were like, what are you doing? Like, why would you take a job that is lower? I literally took lower pay. I took lower stock. It wasn't just the title that changed. And I think that was the single best career decision I ever made. It just put my career on a completely different trajectory, which was a much better fit for me and my natural talents. So I did that job for 18 months. Then we tripled the revenue of that business. And then they gave me six more businesses to run and promoted me to the level. I was. Interesting. A uh, couple of things there. One, uh, I, I love the fact that you consciously took a step back. Per, it was potentially going to be two steps back, but you negotiated just for one step back to take many steps forward. Secondly, looking at your LinkedIn profile, that's not visible. So you choosing to like market yourself, like on LinkedIn, like I yeah. don't think you're hiding it, but like on your LinkedIn profile, it says brand manager shopping, director of marketing, commerce, senior director marketing, VP business unit marketing, VP general manager, Yahoo Autos, 
group VP, general manager, local and marketplace. There were different levels of VP. Yeah. So you're right. It, it's not externally visible, but yeah. it was definitely internally visible. But yeah. I think that's so important because people have an internal narrative that, yeah. hey, you weren't digging that. You took a step back to focus on what you were really passionate yeah. about, but you can communicate it externally a way that looks like not only the Yahoo stuff, everything beyond that looks quite impressive of a trajectory and nobody yeah. nobody has to know those challenges that you have. Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about that, but that's a good point. Yeah. And yes, how we market ourselves is a whole nother story. And what's interesting about it is I have more perspective now too about the fact that most people don't actually care about this stuff. And I think as you're coming up, and certainly as I was coming up, I cared a lot more about titles and status than I needed to, right? Because at the end of yeah. the day, that isn't how people make decisions on who they should put into jobs. Titles don't pay for tuition. They don't pay for your kids' yeah. dance classes. They don't pay for the mortgage. They don't pay for anything. And it's interesting to hear your epiphany too. So I didn't get to see Gallup and maybe it was um, Marcus Buckingham or something, or I, I don't know. He went to work for Gallup after, or I started at Gallup. Yeah. I think, yeah. So I didn't go to that, but I had a very similar epiphany when I dropped out of my psych PhD program and we both have a psychology undergrad degree. Like I, I wasn't at like a fancy uh, offsite, but I was at a bar and everybody's talking about psychology and all these psychology studies. And I'm like, what watching football a month later i went into my advisor's office and i quit and i went back to live at home with my parents and work on wall street for a little bit as i figured stuff out awesome jennifer so we're uh we're running a little low on time but i i do want to dig into your board leadership opportunity so you've had so many amazing things you've started companies you've worked for some of the best companies in the world you've sold companies to google and other organizations like that you teach at the Stanford Business School uh, or Stanford Graduate School of Business, GSB. But you're also on the board of, or have been, or were on the board of lots of companies, Weight Watchers, which by the way, Oprah is on the board, which I think is awesome. Not just because my wife was on the show, but I think it's cool yeah. to be in the same boardroom with Oprah. How, how have you thought about your board membership? How did that happen? Like, is that something that you wanted? Talk about how that occurred and advice that you have. And especially for women, a lot of my women clients want to get that experience. And often you look around the boardroom, OpenAI is the latest example. The three last board members were men. The three new board members are men. I think all white men, maybe an Indian, I don't know. But how did you get into board leadership yeah. and what advice do you have for others that want to follow your path? I get this question a lot, as you mentioned, especially from women, but in general, from people who want to get on boards. First of all, I will say that I have really valued and learned a lot from my board experience, especially if you want to be an entrepreneur, a founder, a leader of a company. It's very helpful to have board experience because you see, see the opposite side. And so I can really pretty easily put myself in the shoes of my own board members and thinking, you know, what would I want to know as a board member? And if there's a problem coming, wouldn't I want to know in advance and vice versa as a board member, I can pretty easily put myself in the shoes of the CEO and think how they might be feeling. I'd say my advice for getting started is don't put too much pressure on yourself about where you start. Like the key is to just get started. This is also true of purposeful. The main lesson is I call it little C courage, like just do something, take some action and that propels you forward. And so for board service, the first action might be something as basic as like signing up for a course on board governance or writing a board bio and getting some advice on it or joining one of the organizations that helps people get you know, board ready. And then in terms of where to start, you know, it is true that some people, if they have very good work experience and so forth, can go straight to a public company board, but most people don't. And I certainly didn't. I started on nonprofit boards and then I did my first private company board. And then I did my first public company board. And then after that I did others. And now I've taken my first role as lead independent director. So things build on each, on each other over time. I will say without mentioning company that at one point I was um, offered a board role for, on a public company board and a lot of people advised me not to take it because they thought it wasn't prestigious enough that mm -hmm. I should wait for something that was more showy and more people knew about. And I just thought to myself, these experiences don't come by every day. 
And I maybe since I've wanted this for a while, I should just take it and try it out. And I am so glad that I did because I learned an incredible amount. We did end up eventually the company got sold. And so the board disbanded anyway, and I was able to go on other boards. But even if I had stayed on that board for 10 years or something, I think it still would have been extremely valuable to me. And so I think the same way we were talking about status before of like how much do titles matter? It really doesn't matter here. You know, sure, you can get a fancy, well-known named board, or you can get a smaller board where you can add a lot of value and learn a lot. And that's often a really great place to start. Cool. Well, I've learned a lot here. I got um, a good book recommendation from you about Robin Roberts' book and Crossing the Chasm. So two last questions I like to ask our guests here. One, if you can leave our listeners with one piece of sick career advice, and you've left a lot already, but what's a one final part parting piece of sick career advice you'd offer? So I love acronyms. When I was growing up, my family used to use acronyms for almost everything. We had like a list with that was up on the refrigerator with a magnet. And so I've developed a whole list of acronyms. In my last day of class, I have like a main life takeaway is that's all acronyms. But one of the acronyms I use for work, especially earlier career people or people who are changing careers, I call it JAV. It stands for just add value. Doesn't really matter what job you have, what title you have. You will be most successful if you just add value, whatever needs to be done. I, there's a picture I've used in the past. It's a, one of those signs that sits outside of a church that you can like change the letters on the sign. Mm -hmm. And it's, they have this big giant lawn outside the church and the sign says, whoever has the mower, please mow on Sunday. And that's the thing. It's like, if you have the mower, mow the lawn. And that's the way you will become successful and get increasing opportunities inside the organizations that you work in. So that's my career advice. That's awesome. I love acronyms. The whole acronym SICK is steer your career with Kadima. Oh, right. So exactly. I, I, I love it. I love acronyms too. And we have one ABL, always be looking. So uh, always be my learning. My other one is DMSU. This is my other favorite one, which is sometimes when we get a signal that something might be going wrong, we go into our heads and like get super anxious about the thing that might happen. And so DMSU is don't make shit up. Before nice. it actually happens, DM us you. I like that. And I'll match your acronym with fear. Add. False evidence appearing real. So it's yes, similar to exactly. the DMSU. It's similar, like the story, very similar. The right. stories that we tell ourselves. So yeah, we can go on and on about different acronyms here, but uh, we do need to wrap up. So the last question I have, Jennifer, is how can people find you, support you, get in touch with you, figure out, like learn about rising teams, purposeful? How can people find and support you? Would love to connect with people. I am at J Dulski, J D U L S K I on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Risingteam.com. We'd love to have you come learn about it. And Purposeful is on Amazon or purposefulbook.com. Awesome, Jennifer. Well, thank you so much for your generosity. Thanks for meeting me in person when you were out in New York for, I think it was a board meeting or a customer meeting. I don't know what it was. Thanks for coming here into my backyard on the East Coast. Glad uh, you're enjoying yourself on the West Coast there. And uh, yeah, I just want to say sincerely thank you for what I learned here. Give me a couple of new books, recommendations. <laughs> and uh, enlighten me with some good acronyms. So thank you. Sounds great. Let me know what you think of the books if you read them. And thanks for having me. I will. Thank you, Jennifer.